other thing I'll say. Before, Sorry. Um, no, that's okay. The other thing I'll say before we get started is that, um, you know, this is, I, I've tried to gear my presentation in two ways, you know, because you're both, you know, as members of GMPT, we really do need your help um, in terms of like supporting our goals of the legislature, which ultimately support you. But I know that for some of you, at least, especially for larger members, that you may have, you know, individual things you're trying to get done at the legislature, like perhaps getting bonding money um, for your legislator or for your projects or something like that. So if, I've tried to to gear this relationship sort of with an eye towards building a relationship with your legislator, as well as sort of helping, again, both your individual causes and our cause as um, an organization. It's really important, I would say, as an organization, you know, you Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails has a lobbyist in me that I'm up at the legislature. But one of the things I've learned through all of these years of lobbying is that it really is a team sport. And the legislators, you know, are going to listen more if they're hearing both from me, but equally important or probably more important in many situations from their local folks. And so this is kind of geared towards how do you do that? How do you start your relationships and whatnot? So I'm going to try and share the screen again. If it doesn't work, we'll just send the presentation out afterwards. Is it sharing, Carlin? Okay. So I am just going to get started on this. And again, like I said, I get really bored if I'm talking for too long, so please do ask questions as we go along. Um, now we're going to see if I can get the presentation to work. All right. Um, preparing for success at the legislature. Um, legislative success really depends on relationships. Legislating is, you know, it is a relationship building exercise, exercise and strong relationships are the foundation for success at the legislature. Um, what I have found, and I think anybody who's been at the Capitol for a while, I see Jennifer's on here, she probably would agree with me on this, is that getting to know your legislator before you need to ask them for something is really essential. There's a, it's just not as easy calling in a panic, asking for something, you know, having them know you um, in advance is really the way to get things done. And so I, I think right now that uh, your goal should be for your legislator to know you by name if they see you in the street. I think the bonus would be, however, to have them call you with questions. Um, you want to be seen as the expert on parks and trails and perhaps on other topics, depending upon what your role is. But, um, you know, having them know who you are is really helpful because, you know, ideally you'd love to have them, especially if something challenging comes up, call you as that expert. But um, it is it is key. Um, now, you may be asking yourself, I mean, this this is a basic question, but why do I need to get, you know, why do I need to get to know my legislators? Why do we care about this whole business? And I'm, you probably, if you're on this uh, Zoom call, you can probably answer this question, but um, let's walk through that a little bit. You know, the thing is, is that legislators will be making important issues um, that affect you and your department, um, you know, and the parks and trails in your area. And those those decisions may impact funding. Um, for example, it, it is a budget year again, and they will be making decisions on how do we split up that leg legacy funding. And um, I am hoping that things go okay for legacy this year. Um, they just uh, named, I think this may be, I haven't told Carlin and uh, uh, Shannon on the board yet, but we just found out our legacy chairs on Friday and we have Leon Lilly back in the house. And then Fuang Her, who is a legislator whom I really like from St. Paul, char chairing it in the Senate. But um, we still don't know, um, you know, will they still still support 40, 40, 20 and funding for the um, uh, the, uh, you know, the legacy for Greater Minnesota. Um, Gina, did you have a question? I saw your hand go up. Nope. Okay, well, you know, they'll be deciding on that. Um, you know, a big priority for us has been um, grant funding, not just the legacy funding, but also funding for the greater or for, um, the DNR programs. So we'll be pushing on that. And then policies on parks and trails development. Now, I, for those of you who attended our annual meeting at the end of um, October, there was probably, you probably heard me say that I, you know, I was a little bit worried depending upon the election outcome um, that we might be seeing a lot of challenges on policy issues. Um, and I'll be honest that I, I was one of many who was um, anticipating we might have uh, a 
the Republicans controlling both the House and Senate. And from a policy standpoint, that's where we've run into problems in terms of, you know, pushing against the, the ability to use eminent domain and things like that. Now, with the Democrats in charge of both the House and Senate, I see less issues there, but there could be other policy challenges that we just don't know about because we haven't seen a completely democratically controlled legislature in a while. So there still could be challenges on policies. I just don't know what they are. Um, another thing I want to say about that um, majority, like I said, I think a lot of us were expecting a different outcome on election day. And um, I mean, the fact of the matter is, unless you're living in like Rochester, Duluth, St. Cloud or Moorhead or Mankato, you may be um, looking at a situation where your legislator is not in the majority. And even if they're not in the majority, their support is still important. And it's still, again, really important to get to know them now, um, you know, important for a couple of reasons. You know, when it's a bonding bill, you know, Republican votes are going to be needed, even if the Democrats are in control. Um, another reason is, is that the Senate has a razor thin majority and um, one vote, you know, can sway things either way. And on um, things like legacy, sometimes that gets to be more of a rural urban question. So we may maybe may be needing support from both parties on that. So again, getting to know your legislator is really important no matter what. And so we're gonna need your help on priorities that impact parks and trails throughout the state. Um, another question, I know that, you know, I, I, I can see just by looking at this, I've got folks who are in the parks departments. I've got folks who are, um, I think we have a county commissioner on here. We have a city administrator on here. We've got Renee who runs the, the commission. Um, and, you know, one thing you may be wondering is like, who should be in charge of building that relationship? You know, is there one person who should be talking to the legislator or many? And I'll be honest, if you're in a city or county, Ultimately, you have to follow, you know, sort of what you're told. But in general, I think that more than one person, it is beneficial when more than one um, one person at your city or county has a relationship with your legislator. Um, and, you know, there's a number of different reasons. You know, um, part of it is, is, you know, not everyone's going to be an, a subject matter expert on everything and not everyone will be available all the time. So, you know, another thing to keep in mind is that there are some legislators that will give more deference to elected officials in their district. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, being able to, you know, look eye to eye with somebody else who has an election certificate is important to folks. But other lawmakers see staff as impartial experts as well. And that's where, again, if even if you're not a uh, um, a city or county official, you know, you are seen as somebody who really knows this area again. So it's really important you all have that relationship. You know, even businesses and nonprofits can be helpful. Um, I'll also say that joint interactions with other staff or elected officials may make sense. Um, not to pick on Carlin here, but, you know, she's in one of those areas. Actually, both she and Jennifer are from um, Olmstead County, which is also Rochester. And, you know, it may be you know, in some situations make make sense for them to talk as a group or in a situation like, um, you know, where uh, where Shannon's looking up in, in Warren, when you have multiple cities, they're all in the same district or multiple counties that can make sense too. to um, at certain times to be talking together. Um, one thing I would say is do check in with other members of your organization. I do know some cities and counties have a pecking order in terms of who's supposed to talk to the legislators. Uh, make sure you're not going to be like stepping on any toes. Um, that being said, if you're not going to be stepping on any toes, I always think it's better to, for more than one person to have a relationship with a legislator. And I would also say, again, if you're in a larger organization, make sure you're keeping others up to date. Um, now let's talk about actually talking. And so you want to be thinking about um, as you're going in and talking to a legislator, what what is going to influence them? How are they making their decisions on what things to vote on, what to bring forward? Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, constituents have a big impact on what legislators think. These are the people that, you know, voted them in and could vote them out. Um, but one thing I, I have found is that sometimes the loud few can have an outsized influence on legislators, making them think that, uh, you know, oh, everybody here hates this park project in my district. I mean, you may have run into that. Um, and even though that's probably not true in many situations, you know, if somebody's really loud, that's why it's important to remember that A, you're a constituent and your voice should matter to your legislator, but also um, that the voices of others in your area have an impact on there. So keep in mind, you know, 
who they're hearing from and what they're hearing. Um, a couple other things to think about again and remember when you're when you're building your relationship is that um, the the caucus will have an impact on on legislators, particularly when they're not familiar with the topic. You know, if you haven't talked to them and they've got a park issue that comes up, they may just listen to their caucus in terms of how to vote or to you know one of the legislators who shares a seat with them. You know, your legislator may not know much about this issue, and if you haven't been talking to them, you know, they may look to others. Um, family and friends can have an impact, and that's why I always, you know, it may be, you know, you're from an area where you were friends with the legislator before they got in, um, or maybe somebody who doesn't like the project was. So family and friends are an important influence. Um, not going to not gonna, uh uh lie sometimes contribution people who gave contributions or made expenditures um in an election will have an impact um it may not affect as much in this area but it does does sometimes impact um the media um i'll be honest uh you know whether it be letters to the editor you know stories in your local newspaper and um you, that's something you can use to your advantage again uh when you're trying to push forward or promote something and then also just those intangible information and facts, you know, are important as well as policy analysis. Um, so something to be prepared with as you go meet with your legislators. Okay, sorry, going to the next slide. Um, so how do you build that relationship? Let's talk about a little bit of nuts and bolts. Um, this probably should go without saying, but you know, introduce yourself to your new legislator and tell them your position, who you are with the city. You know, you're the city. You know, you run the parks, you're the county uh, commissioner, you're county administrator. Um, let them know who you are and, you know, do this by, you know, give them a call, send them an email. Um, you know, right now, I think one of the big things, if you haven't done it already, congratulate them on winning election or re-election. It's not easy to be a legislator, you know, and just saying, hey, glad to see you again or glad to see that you're going to be there. Let them know. Try to get a meeting. Again, being able to talk ideally in person, um, you know, maybe when they're in the district or not, can be something formal. It can be something informal. But um, ask them for a meeting. Um, have coffee with them. Um, you know, stop by. It's not. There's not many that do this, but there are some legislators who have in district office hours. They might be formal, or they might. You know, they're again, if they're you know in a smaller city, maybe you know that they're at the coffee shop every Friday. But you know, stop by if you can. Um, if they're holding um, town hall meetings, attend those. Use any opportunity you can to uh, work with your legislator. Um, now, here's a couple other ideas, and I know um, some of you have done this. Um, I, I, he's not on the call, but I was just talking to um, Joe Tart, who's one of our board members, who said that he takes every opportunity he can to invite his legislators to every opening, everything he does at the park, and they often take him take him up on that. So, you know, invite them if you have a park board, invite them to a meeting um, or some kind of similar gathering. Um, arrange a tour or a visit to one of your parks and trails. And it can be something very formal, like your ribbon cutting on a new trail or a new building or shoveling for whatever. Or it could be just, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, take them through your park or trail on something that's new. Um, you know, one thing to think about is doing it when there's going to be more people there. I mean, that can always be a good technique, especially if you you have a legislator who doubts the value of parks and trails, you know, bring them on a day when there's going to be a lot of people there, you know, you have a big event or something. And so they can see all the different people from their district who are taking advantage of what there is to offer. Um, but I think really engaging and you can really, I mean, I, I mean, maybe there's a few cynical folks out there, but most people like to go to a park or a trail and, you know, getting your legislators out there and sort of really seeing, um, you know, what it is that you do and what is there to offer and how the residents in their district are taking advantage of it, that is really powerful. Um, you know, and it's it's a lot better that, you know, it's a lot easier to illustrate, you know, what you're doing, you know, as compared to a lot of other areas that they may be working on. So really try to take advantage of that. Um, you folks, all of you have a lot to offer with your parks and trail system, you know, make sure your legislators understand that. Um, another thing to remember is to, you know, always recognize what your legislators are doing. Um, if they've helped you, if they've, you know, we've got legislators that, that'll be authoring our bills. Um, and I try to um, make sure that the, you know, the members who are in their districts know this, but if they're, if they're authoring a bill for us, 
you're authoring a bill for somebody else, send them an email, thank them, um, or send us a, a handwritten note, or, you know, thank them in a newsletter or something like that. Um, you know, legislators honestly get, you know, regardless of which party they're in, they get picked on by people who are not happy with their work. If they're doing something good, recognize their work, um, you know, privately or publicly. Um, another thing to do is um, some of you will be coming down for Legislative Action Day or you'll be in St. Paul for any reason during the legislative session. Stop by your legislators' offices. You might not be able to catch them um, if you don't have an appointment ahead of time, but, you know, leave a note. Introduce yourself. You know, each legislator will have a legislative assistant that, at least in the Senate, will sit directly outside their office. In the house, they'll sit close to their office. You know, ask if they're available. If they're not, introduce yourself either way. Tell them that you're from the district. What do you do? And leave a note for the legislator. Let them know you've been there. And then repeat. And uh, you know, uh, you know, a relationship with your legislator. It's like it's like building any friendship. You're not going to be best friends with most people the first time you meet them. But schedule regular get-togethers. You know, try to connect with them. You know, in in these different ways. But relationships take time and persistence. Sorry, I'm not very good with switching slides. Um, so you may be asking yourself, "Hey, Liz, how do I make that initial outreach?" You know, it's it's not always that easy. Um, so for existing legislators, they will have. Um, they may have the same legislative staff at minimum they still have somebody assigned to them and that's available on um the house or senate web page and i'm sorry i should have put that in the presentation but um email or call their staff to see if you can set something up in district um keep in mind that uh the new legislators may not have staff until closer to january of next year because officially um sometimes they do, they don't officially take office until the uh whatever the that second tuesday of january is um if you can't do it that way use personal connections quite frankly if you have the legislator's cell phone or email you know use that um or check in with your other city or county officials to find out if they know how to get a hold of the legislator but make that initial outreach and like i said introduce yourself congratulate them and you know try to meet with them All right, well, this is uh, very touchy in terms of advancing slides. Um, now let's talk about that. Oh, there's a, something in the chat that just showed up. How will the outgoing legislators, uh, Renee just asked a question and her question was, how will the outgoing legislators, legislative assistants get reassigned? And um, that is a good question. And I, what ends up happening honestly is, um, Usually, so a legislative assistant is the person that provides sort of staff support to the legislators. In the Senate, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. In a in the House, it's depending upon the seniority and whether the person is in the majority or the minority. They either have a legislative assistant they share with one person or two people. And we do have, you know, I think our turnovers. We have sixty four new legislators coming in, I think my number could be off. We have a more than 50. I think it's closer to 60. Um, I think it's 64. Uh, but we have a whole bunch of people coming in. They have legislative assistance. Um, I'll be honest, you do see no matter what happens during an election, a turnover of some legis some LAs. So they some of them have just left, particularly if they're party lost or they may have picked up a new job. Um, what will happen is, is that closer to um, January 1st, the people, you know, basically the HR department will assign them to new people. Um, sometimes you'll see that they get, uh, you know, like uh, promoted to a different position within the caucus or whatnot, but that will be announced closer to them. So I hope that's helpful, Renee. Um, but they will usually get reassigned unless they decide to go somewhere else. Um, but uh, a couple things on communicating with the legislators, kind of switching back. Um, you know, one thing to, to know is don't assume the legislator knows who you are, at least at first. If you've met the legislator 10 times, hopefully they will know who you are. But sometimes um, legislators meet a lot of people and they will, you know, if you kind of forget to say who you are, they might do the fake it till they make it and pretend like they know you when they don't actually know you. So unless it's a close friend, it never hurts to introduce yourself, you know, remind them of who you are with your title. 
Now, this one, I, I'll be honest, this next piece of advice, parks people are some of the nicest people I know. So this advice is probably not necessary, but I include it in every lobbying pr uh, presentation I make, and that is always be professional. Um, nobody responds to negativeness or na nastiness. You don't like getting yelled at, neither do they. Um, again, it's hard to imagine any of you doing that, but I always like to give that warning. Um, be passionate about important issues, but if you are threatening, rude, or over the top, you really lose your effectiveness. Um, do be gently persistent. And I'm going to be persistent with this message. Um, periodic visits, calls, and emails are, are good. Um, if you've got a project going on, you know, it's a perfect excuse to, uh, to, to reach out to them. L let them know how things are pro progressing. Or if you're going to be starting something up, you just got a grant to start a new building or new trail, keep them up to that. Um, invite them to relevant events in your district. Um, or even let them know, like if you, you know, have, you know, if you know they have kids or grandkids and you're doing some programming around, you know, that they're, they might enjoy, let them know. I mean, again, it's a, it's a good way to build a connection and who does more, you know, nobody does more fun stuff than Parks and Trails folks. So, you know, let them know what's going on, use it as an opportunity. Um, and, you know, it's important to keep that persistence up because regardless of, you know, where they may fall on the political scale or where you do, um, you know, lawmakers, you know, most of them, I can't promise you all, but most will respect your input and they want to serve the people of their district. So um, when you're doing something, um, be prepared with facts and relevant stories. You will run into legislators, again, especially if they don't know you or they're just listening to their buddy at the bar um, or the coffee shop, you know, they may have misconceptions or they just know nothing about what you're talking about. So don't assume they know about the issue and Sometimes they may be misinformed about an issue. So be ready with concrete information, facts and figures um, that, that will help them. Stories are also really, really helpful. Um, it's good to have facts and figures to back things up, but we humans, we remember things by storytelling. So, you know, if you can tell stories about how your project has helped your district or how you see it helping in other districts, that's going to be really important. Try to tug at their heartstrings. Um, you know, we don't like to admit it, but, you know, emotions and stories really do have an impact on persuasion. Um, another thing, again, I think I mentioned this earlier, like if you're arranging a park visit, try to do it when it's busy, if you can. I mean, I know that's trickier in the winter. It's, say, you know, like 15 below and not everybody's showing up to your park. Um, but if you can, arranging it when they, when they are busy does help sort of signify that importance. Um, again, I emphasized this earlier, but do acknowledge when your legislator does something positive. It's not easy. So thanking them publicly in the media or city no newsletters. Um, private thank you notes are also really nice, whether it's handwritten or an email. Um, also, don't give up. We, uh, we call it affectionately the Darth Vader strategy. Sometimes with legislators, it can take a long time to turn them away from the dark side. Um, or even just a long time to, to educate them. You know, with all of these new legislators, you know, you get some that were elected um, because they were particularly passionate about one issue. Um, unfortunately, it's rarely that they're getting elected because they're particularly passionate about parks and trails, but you can get them there. Just remember, it will, it will take time and work. Um, and there's always some way to find a common ground. Maybe hard, but you can always try that. But one thing you have to remember is you never want a legislator to say, I never heard from any of my constituents about this issue. Um, and, uh, you know, you will hear that. You'll hear it in hearings. You'll hear it when you're talking to somebody else. They'll be like, well, you know, you ask them afterwards, why did you vote this way? And it's like, well, I never heard from anybody about it. They need to be hearing from you. Again, so that's why don't give up. Be persistent. So what should you be communicating with them about? Sort of like, what do you want to be talking about? You know, once you get past the, you know, who are you and the names and the chit chat, um, talk about how important parks and trails are to your community. Stories are really important. You know, individually, you know, talk about a program, talk about a project. Um, there's also a lot of stats out there uh, in terms of how it impacts economic development health and wellness. Again, you might need to, you know, tailor that message to who you are. If you've got a, you know, a, a legislator who's all about jobs, 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 or who really thinks, you know, like we shouldn't be spending any taxpayer money until, unless we can talk about a return on investment, 
talk about how things impact the economy, how it improves health and wellness, but you know, really be able to talk about those benefits. Um, you should also be communicating about the specific specifics in your parks and trails system. You know, let them know recent grants or other funding that you've received and how it's being used. You know, help you know help demonstrate your value. Um, talk about the needs in your system, plans for the future. So just kind of like they so they know where it's at um, and where things are going. Um, also, again, as you get to know them, um, you know, we want you to talk about what's going on in your district, but we also hopefully want you to talk about our priorities as well, because we can't get things done at the legislature unless they understand the importance for that statewide perspective. So um, talk about the importance of legacy funds to the extent that, you know, I know not all cities are eligible for legacy funds, but maybe you can see, you know, how it's benefited, you know, your county or the area near you. Um, talk about the importance of DNR grant programs. You know, you look at the outdoor recreation program, the, the trail connection program, and almost every city or county in the state has received a grant from those at some point. Talk about how it's benefited from you or how you might take advantage of it um, in the future. And also, we will be having some specific bills. Those won't get introduced until January. We will let you know, but it's helpful if you can mention, you know, that again, um, you know, we're going to be looking for their support to make sure Greater Minnesota gets a share of legacy funds and that we're paying for the commission's work and that we're putting money towards local parks and trails. So those are some of the things to be talking about. Has anybody got any questions, by the way? I just feel like I'm talking and talking and talking. <laughs> no? Okay. Um, now we're going to talk about one of the harder things. And uh, some of you may have experienced this. Um, and I'm not seeing anybody from the worst offender districts, but there are some that are out there. Uh, there are legislators who are, we'll call them non-responsive, you know, and I'll be honest, sometimes they're downright hostile, um, you know, uh, but you, you know, there are techniques to be dealing with those folks. Um, sometimes you might need to change the messenger. Um, Sometimes it might be just something as simple as like you both went to grade school and hated each other or, you know, you know, their sister used to date your brother and that was a bad breakup um, or whatever. So it might be that somebody else needs to be talking to them, a different city council member, different commissioner or di different city staff person. Also look to enlist others. You know, are there local business leaders or local community leaders who can help? Um, you know, identify, you know, every legislator has a friend, you know, they don't get elected unless they know other people in the community, try to figure out who they're going to be listening to, whom they trust and can work with and try to work with them on, you know, maybe change that messenger. I think it's also important, and I think this really, you know, is effective on parks and trail stuff, in educate and enlist the public, you know, help, you know, if, if a legislator is hearing not just from, you know, from me and you, but from others in the district about how important, you know, a project is or what's going on, that can be helpful. So, you know, find some of your relevant stakeholders and interested in community members who are the leaders out there who can help, you know, share the word with the public and more importantly, get that word back to the legislators. Tap into community groups, you know, maybe your local rotary or something like that, but tap into those groups to try and get to that non-responsive legislator. Now, um, and I, I want to, I'll be honest here. I think that if you, you know, again, continue to work on it, try to get, try that Darth Vader strategy, pull them back from the dark side. Sometimes you need to get a project done and you need a bill sponsor. And I'll be honest, occasionally people have to go to a legislator in an adjoining district. That's not an ideal situation. It occasionally happens. Um, so if there is an individual project you're trying to bring forward and you just cannot get your legislator to, to do it, because there are a few legislators who do not, for example, who refuse to introduce bonding bills. It might, need, might be that you need to go to someone else. But ideally, again, trying to build that relationship before you need something um, sort of working on that long-term strategy, hopefully you will not find yourself in that situation. Just a couple other tactics that work. Um, and so this will only, I, I don't think there's any nonprofits on the call, but if they are, um, you'd probably use a letter instead of a resolution, but um, resolutions from your city and counties um, can be helpful to state your support for a specific, either a bill or a project or opposition to a certain thing that can be helpful. Emails and phone calls from constituents. Again, hearing from you, but 
Um, also hearing from others in the district is important. Letters to the editor or guest columns are, are good. Also getting to know legislative staff is a great way to sort of help build that relationship. You, I think I said at the beginning, you know, one goal should be for that legislator to know your name. Also a good thing for you to know the name of the legislative staff and have them know you um, is also really helpful um, in terms of getting things done. Um, I do wanna say again, legislated legislating and advocacy at the legislature is a team sport um so you know if you are hearing things from your legislator you know that impact what we're working on please let me know or let a board member know um that can be really helpful because you might be hearing something good or you might be hearing something bad and either way you know connect with us and also again work with other cities or counties in your district unless you're in an extremely like you're in a situation like say Olmstead or or Mankato most of you are going to have multiple cities and counties in your district so um you know stay in touch with those others um, on these kind of things um so kind of getting wrapping up um sort of your next steps I want to encourage all of you if you haven't done so already reach out to your newly elected or re-elected legislators to congratulate them try to get on their calendar to connect um or get to know them so um that's kind of all I have formally I guess I I want to throw it open to questions or does, do other people have suggestions or comments on what works for them I'm not gonna call on anybody because that would be mean, but um anybody this is, this is Gina. I'll just offer that when you say it's a team sport, mm -hmm. um it really is um a a good experience to work with other entities in a conversation with um a legislator. Um, it makes it more of a conversation, um, and I, I've just really enjoyed that approach. I'll just yeah. offer that. Um, thank you, Gina, and uh, thank you for emphasizing that point. Anyone else have questions? Renee? We will I your do. Um, so great information as always thanks for sharing this i'm just you know i'm thinking of the vast turnover this year and yes. that's where the legislative assistant and also committee assistants came from because we get to know those folks yeah as well and depend on them for their help um getting a hold of folks so what are the first days going to look like um is it just going to be chaos as people are just trying to find their offices or what what are we expecting here i mean i'm reaching out to several of the new um newly elected legislators in the duluth area um i would say that um at least my experience um from i i was a way back when i won't say how many years ago i uh worked as a legislative assistant and um you know I, unless the caucuses bring the legislative assistance I can't, you know, they've done it differently, but like when I was brought on, like literally my first day was the first day of session and it was utter chaos. And, um, you know, legislators don't necessarily know where their offices are. They don't know who their staff is. I mean, I have noticed already, you know, one change that we will see over the past three years is both the House and the Senate have said that they're gonna have their buildings open and that people will be present. I don't know yet whether that means that like we'll be able to go, as I call it, free range lobbying, wandering around the buildings or not. But um, I have seen some legislators have started at least returning ones moving into their office. Um, I would say for new ones, um, it may be more challenging to get a hold of them at their legislative offices, at least for the first couple of days, because um, they're going to be getting a lot of calls. They're going to be getting a lot of emails. And the legislative assistants um, may or may not know what they're doing. Um, it does remind me of something. Um, so a lot of legislative assistants, there are some who have been, this is their career, and they've been working there for 20 years, and they know what they're doing, and they're very good. Um, other legislative assistants are people, you know, they're fresh out of college, they want to get into politics, and this is what they're doing. Some are going to be really good. Some are not as good as others and so i would say in terms of like reaching out to a legislator 
um, if you reach out through their legislative assistant and don't hear back from them in a couple of days, it never hurts to politely call them back or to email back or to try, like if you emailed them and didn't get a hold of them, call them back. There are some legislative assistants who are just not as organized as others. And, and that's being honest, and you may have to respond. Um, I have found that like if you're working with trying to get a hold of the same legislator, you quickly figure out whether they have a good LA or not. And um, you know, just as in any job, some people are just not as good at the job as others. So again, gentle persistence can apply to staff as well. Um, if it gets to be a problem where they're not, re you know, you're never getting your messages returned or whatever, um, and you know the legislator, you might make an offhand comment to them. But uh, generally, I don't think that's probably going to be necessary for any of you. But um, yeah, it will be a little chaotic for those first couple of weeks trying to, if you can, um, you know, sort of get a hold of them through other channels might be your best bet. But try the legislative office first, you know, and, um, you know, use use different techniques. Carlin? Oh, there's a question in the chat I want to answer. Um, yep. Pat asked, um, since the legislature did not pass a bonding bill in 2022, do we think that they'll pass a bonding bill in 2023? I do think they'll pass a bonding bill in 2023. I'm not going to say 100% certain, but I would say I'm pretty, about 90% confident. A um, couple of reasons I'm confident. Um, probably the first is, is that there's quite a few programs that require federal matching dollars, um, particularly with respect to like... Um, standard other areas that I work on besides parks and trails like wastewater and drinking water um and energy there's a whole bunch of programs out there that need matching dollars and that the state will lose out and I think that we will be seeing a, a big push to get that done and and to be honest there are just some projects um I know of you know multiple cities who literally I won't, I won't say which one I literally have one of the cities I work with whose wastewater plant is falling apart and they've already had to put in several expensive repairs over the last year or two because they need to replace it and they cannot replace it without help from the state. And so there are just some desperate need projects out there, I think, that will drive a bonding bill. And I do think, um, I mean, yeah, Democrats like to spend. Um, so I, I don't know that we're going to see a partial bonding bill. I think we're going to see a big bonding bill. Um, when it will get done is a different question. Um, I think that, um, you know, and some some people would say it's harder to get along with your own party than with the opposite party. I don't know. Uh, we'll see whether the Senate and, and House can come to an agreement on things, as well as um, the other thing to keep in mind about a bonding bill is that it is the one of the few things that the legislature that requires a supermajority. And so that could take a long time to make sure that they're getting Republicans on board um, with the bonding bill. But as mentioned, there are some projects out there and a lot of them, you know, they're in districts in greater Minnesota that have Republican legislators that that need to get done. And so I think that there will be some cooperation. I just don't think it will happen until the I, I don't I'd love to see it, quite frankly, happen in January or February. I don't see it happening until May towards the end of the session, but um, I do think it'll happen. Other questions? I guess one other comment I, I would quickly make on bonding is my understanding is, is that Governor Waltz and uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan will be releasing sort of their version of a bonding bill again in January. But from what I've heard that sort of that bill will only include projects that were in their last year, last year's bill. So just something to keep in mind as well. Anything else? Well, I hope this was helpful. Um, I You can always reach out to me if you have questions about lobbying, reaching out to your legislators, other things like that. It is a team sport. We're all part of that same team, um, you know, and sort of any work that any one of us does to help persuade legislators of the importance of parks and trails helps all of us. So um, thank you for, for participating. And um, our legislative action day is we are going to do a legislative action day next year unless something you know really strange happens you know like the i don't know things get shut down again we're tentatively looking at wednesday february 1st we'll be finalizing that date um soon and we'll send details out about that so mark your calendar for um february 1st we'll be uh, coming into the 
the Capitol talking about how to lobbying and then set you out on meeting your legislators. It's a great way if you have never spent any time at the Capitol lobbying or whether you're an old hand to just come on in. Um, so we'll we'll have that date finalized by the time we send our newsletter out next week, but that's our tentative plan is to do it February 1st. So great. Thanks. Thanks for the info. Always good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, thanks, Elizabeth. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Elizabeth. Taking time. Oh, wait, one more comment in the chat. Oh, great information. Okay, thanks. <laughs> stop the share and uh, see you later. <laughs> mm -hmm.